Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Global Connections Television is an independently produced program that focuses attention on international issues that impact people from Frankfurt, Kentucky to Frankfurt, Germany, and from Alima, Ohio to Lima, Peru. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. Today we're looking at the loss, the dramatic loss, of fish supplies around the world and what can be done to confront this problem. My guest today is an expert in this area. Dr. James Tidwell is the chair of Kentucky State University's Division of Aquaculture. Dr. Tidwell received his PhD in aquaculture from Mississippi State University. He is the past president of both the U.S. Aquaculture Society and the World Aquaculture Society. His primary research interests include the development of alternative species and his work in recent years has concentrated on freshwater prawns and largemouth bass. Dr. Jim Tidwell, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Bill, very good to be with you. I appreciate you being with you, Jim. Let's talk a little bit about the area you're in, aquaculture. Right. Before we get into it, what is a generic definition of aquaculture? It's not just two or three ponds with a bunch of fish thrown in it, is it? It's a, a little broader than that, I guess. Well, it is broad. Uh, probably the most widely used definition would be uh, the production of aquatic plants and animals under controlled or semi-controlled conditions. So. In general terms, when we're speaking to a layman's audience, it's underwater agriculture. Underwater aquaculture. Yeah. Agriculture. Agriculture. <laughs> agriculture. Aquaculture. Instead of soil, we use water. Exactly. And do we, today we see, we read articles, really frightening articles, about how fish supplies are dwindling, primarily, I guess, due to population increases, to perhaps large trawlers going in, mm -hmm. collecting all types of fish. How big of a problem is this in the in the area of affecting the fish supplies? Well, historically, most of the fish used for human consumption have come from the ocean. Um, since three quarters of the planet is covered in ocean, we've always felt like that was a limitless supply. However, we found that that's not so. Uh, as as much as two thirds or uh, up to eighty percent of the ocean fisheries are threatened or what we call maximum sustainable yields. So they're producing all the fish they can produce without really decimating the population. And some of those have, have occurred. Um, but, but basically where we're at with our ocean fisheries is we're at a static zone where they're producing all they can produce and they just can't produce anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, the climate change studies are prolific data has been produced over the past 30, 35 years dealing with climate change and we see that there are dramatic changes taking place in virtually every country of the world because mm -hmm. of what scientists say, 97% of the scientists say is due to climate change. We have a little video of some Bangladeshi fishermen and let's go to that video for a moment, take a look at it and we'll come back and talk about it. Sure. Mohammed Elias has been fishing the Meghna River from the age of 12. Like his father and relatives before him, he depends on the waters of Bangladesh to provide for his family. Now a boat owner, Mohammed hires a handful of fishermen to go out to sea for 10 days at a time to fish for Hilsa, the national fish of Bangladesh. He has noticed changes in the weather over the past several years. When I went fishing as a child, storms happened, but the wind and waves were less frequent. Now the waves are frequent. Our situation is more critical. We are more in danger than before. The livelihood of a fisherman has become an increasingly dangerous one. Stronger storms and more frequent tropical cyclones along the coastlines of Bangladesh are said to be the result of climate change. These traditional fishing boats are made entirely of wood. While they have served the fishermen well for generations, they no longer can cope with the growing intensity of the changing climate. Jim, I think that video gives us an idea of some of the really the major problems that these Bangladeshi fishermen are confronting. As you look at that, as you saw that video, and you, as you think about Bangladesh, one of the most populous countries on the earth, most densely populated, very low-lying area, 
Is this, is this the trend, is this, or is this just a lot, an isolated incident that would apply only to these Bangladeshi fishermen or fishermen in other parts of the world, be it the Philippines or off the coast of Ecuador or whatever, are they being affected by the same problem with mm. the dramatic change in climate and perhaps rising sea levels? And, and it, it will differ uh, in different areas. We, we're, we're very concerned in aquaculture about climate change. Um, a big part of that is because the animals that we raise are all cold-blooded animals. So the temperature, when we talk about climate change, global warming, uh, our animals are not able to resist any kind of change in temperature. They're very much victims of their environment. So the animals that we propagate are more subject to impacts from climate change than, than other animals like uh, mammals, like cows or pigs or things like that, that control their own body temperature. Uh, an example like Bangladesh, Bangladesh will be disproportionately impacted. The fact that they are such a low-lying area, they're already prone to floods, they're already prone to the monsoon impacts over there. And as, as we found with, with our hurricanes, their monsoons, it's a, it's a gradual process until that big storm comes in and then it's amplified as that storm's a bigger storm and that, um, that surge is a, a higher surge. And in some place like Bangladesh, it can literally impact hundreds or even thousands of square miles. So, uh, and they very much depend, they're a big aquaculture producer. That production tends to be in some of those low lying areas. So they will be disproportionately impacted by climate change and their aquaculture industry will probably be disproportionately impacted as an industry. Mm -hmm. Now, how much seafood is being produced now by aquaculture, aquaculture farms around the world? And then how much will we need in the future yeah. to offset our losses and an increase in population? Right. Uh, as, as we said, historically, mm -hmm. most of the uh, fish came from the oceans, what we call capture fisheries. We're right now at a juncture where we're about 50-50. About half is coming from capture fisheries. Mm -hmm. The other half is coming from aquaculture. So we're at a real watershed point right now. However, the major driver is, yes, we are eating more on a per capita basis, but the real driver is population change as we look at the graph of population. So even if it's every new person eats the same amount as the other people, uh, the, the big driver is population growth. So th this year we're 50-50. In a year from now, aquaculture will be 51, uh, capture mm -hmm. fisheries 49. Basically, every additional pound that we come up with on the global frame uh, has to come from aquaculture. The ocean can't produce anymore. So the portion or proportion produced by aquaculture will only increase every year and the major driver mm -hmm. Uh, is population <laughs> growth. To put it in a context we understand better in the U.S. and specifically in Kentucky, uh, about a year ago aquaculture passed beef as a major producer of protein for the world population. So aquaculture is already larger than beef just to put it in a context that a lot more people can relate to. Mm -hmm. Well it's been estimated that China, India, the Philippines, Bangladesh, uh, some of the South Asian countries are producing about 90% of the aquaculture, the fish from uh, aquaculture ponds and what have you. How, as we look at this, uh, I think the U.S. is ranked 11th in there. What are some of the conditions that go into this? Why are some of the countries in Southeast Asia doing uh, or moving forward in this area and a country maybe like the U.S. or some of the European countries may not be doing as well? Do we look at climate? Do we look at cost? What, what figures into that? Well, we have to look at all those, just like we do in, in any competitive business. And just like a, a many, many of the products that we see in, in our large big, big box stores like Walmart, if you look at the made-in tag on those, an awful lot of those are coming out of China and, and those other countries. So it's a number of factors that figure into that, big ones being uh, labor cost, other factors, uh, uh, real estate cost, uh, things like, um, to be honest with you, more lax environmental restrictions and the cost associated mm -hmm. with our more uh, intensive uh, environmental oversights. So all those factors figure together. And even areas like, uh, you know, China is 
supposedly a communist country, but they understand capitalism very well. And if they say central government says go build a big fish hatchery or a big feed mill, it gets built. So it, mm -hmm. it's there's certain efficiencies that actually go with that type of approach. So it's a number of factors that come together. Uh, in the U.S., our high labor costs, our high land costs, let's say we're talking about putting in production of, uh, let's say, shrimp uh, along the coast, our real estate sold by the foot rather than the acre along our much more developed coastline mm -hmm. here in the United States. So. Mm -hmm. And that all factors into it without it a doubt. It all has to it factor in. Does. So, yeah. Well, now this area, this issue, as well as uh, millions of others, the United Nations has been dealing with. One of the major United Nations agencies, the Food and Agriculture Organization. Right. Right. What have they been doing? What has FAO, the commonly called FAO, been doing to help confront this problem and to work with you and other aquaculturalists around the world? Well, the, the FAO is really our central repository of information. When, if I want to know what China's producing uh, mm -hmm. tonnage-wise or what species they're producing or, or how they're producing it, really the only place to go for that kind of information is FAO statistics, and they maintain those. FAO's job distilled down to a short version is what is the human population on this world going to do and how are we going to feed them? So that's a whole lot. So they do a lot of, of gathering of statistics and projecting uh, things like global uh, climate change and those other factors like that. So FAO is, is really, like I said, our central repository of information of who's doing what and how it's being done. They also play a very large role in organizing. So if, if we want to to address and bring in the experts to address the question of the impact of climate change on aquaculture. They will call together a symposium of the best mm -hmm. experts from all around the world. They are very, by definition, international. Put them together, work it out, and come out with a, a report that, that really um, consolidates the state of knowledge at that point identifies the next questions to be addressed and then shares that information freely. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're in the information business just like somebody like me is in the information business. Exactly. Gather it, compile it, and disseminate it, and then pull the people together that need to be addressed to, to talk about those problems. Mm -hmm. And this is a, really a critical role that they play. And, and of course, it's all types of foodstuffs. Yeah. They look at the increase in prices, the inflationary prices of foods in certain parts of the world. They predict what may happen if there's shortages, yes. if there are droughts and wheat is not produced, corn is not produced. So it's, it's really critical to yeah. a basic need of every human on the planet. We all have to have food. Like, like I said, what, what's the population going to do and how are we going to feed them? And, and those <laughs> exactly. are pretty, pretty big questions that, that they deal with. Yeah. That's the, one of the basic. Right. <laughs> one of the basic and, and really, there would be nobody else to address that level of right. concern and question mm -hmm. except the FAO. You, they tie in with things like World Bank and things like that. But if we didn't have FAO, those big questions wouldn't be addressed, really. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And you do need an international forum for that to bring the countries of the world together. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, because no one country can do it. No one region can do it. The Organization of American States in, in the South America and Latin America and the uh, North, uh, North America could not do it by themselves. You have to have an international agency like that. Well, now you were kind enough to provide a little overview, a video of a program. You head up the aquaculture program at Kentucky State University in the Correct. state of Kentucky, USA. And we're going to go to this video for a moment, take a look at it, and we'll come back and talk about it. Sounds good. Kentucky State University. Jim, it sounds like you have a very interesting program at Kentucky State University, and you're in in the top three, two or three or four in the country. How many aquaculture programs are in the 
are there in the United States? I'm, I'm assuming there are hundreds, perhaps thousands worldwide, but in the U.S., how many are there? You know, I, I, I don't have an exact count. There's, there's a number of universities that offer uh, a few classes in aquaculture. Uh, there's a shorter list that offer some level of degree in aquaculture. Um, there's a very much smaller list of what we would consider full service programs that, that have research, extension, and academics all uh, in one program. There's probably what I'd consider maybe 12 to 15 really kind of full service programs. Um, and, and like I said, we're, we're widely regarded as, as probably one of the top three, at the very worst, top five programs in the U.S. We are a full service program doing research extension uh, and academics. Uh, even though we're a small university at Kentucky State University, uh, those other top three to four that we talk about are much bigger institutions like Auburn and LSU and, and those types of institutions. So a very small uh, university like Kentucky State, we're, we're in pretty good company to be even considered in the, in the same rankings with those uh, other bigger institutions. Mm -hmm. That is remarkable because you mentioned Kentucky State University is a small university in comparison to the other schools right. that have aquaculture programs and even in the state of Kentucky. It's yes. one of the smallest yes. in the state system. The smallest public institution. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. And of course, you Kentucky is a small to medium sized state with mm -hmm. about 42,000 square miles and about 4.3 million people. So again, that's not a large state either to speak of, but it's really a remarkable program. Now in your program, do you have international students? Do you have international faculty? Are you involved in recruiting from overseas or where, where do your students come from? Well, really all of the above. Um, and uh, we, we have uh, significant representation of international students. At any one time, I'd say one in four, one in three of our students uh, is, is an international student. We've had students from uh, India, Belize, um, Mexico, China. So, so we're very well uh, represented in that. Uh, we're um, Africa, we've had students from Africa and we're actively uh, recruiting in all those areas. I just got back from Ethiopia just uh, uh, a couple of months ago where we, we spent time with about six universities in, uh, mm -hmm. in Ethiopia that's really made education a very high priority uh, in that country and, and aquaculture is one of the areas that they're interested in. So uh, we're actively recruiting in all those regions. The other thing we've done uh, that's had a big impact internationally is our online courses. Uh, we were early adopters of, of distance learning technologies and specific online courses, and that's been very efficient, very, very uh, high impact area for us. And, and normally I teach a class, I'd have 8, 10, 12 students in there. With these online classes, we've now had students in 38 U.S. states, but 22 countries around the world. So that is so efficient to be able to to teach a class that's, I've got a student in Ethiopia and one in Iceland and, and one in Brazil mm -hmm. at the very same time. So that's had a big international impact. And we have international faculty as well. Some of our faculty are from uh, Russia. We, we have a fish geneticist, our economics and marketing and statistics professors from India. So. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're well represented there as well. Mm -hmm. And of course our viewers can go to www.ksuaquaculture.org and get a lot more information about the program. You mentioned Ethiopia a minute ago and we, we're living in a, a, a world of cooperation today yes. as opposed to confrontation as yes. we did during World Wars I and II. But we're living in this world and we're cooperating more and more. Do you provide technical assistance to countries? I know you've Personally, I know you've been involved in the Dominican Republic. You've been, you went to India not long ago. You mentioned mm -hmm. Ethiopia. Do you lend a hand to folks to help them get started in aquaculture programs in other parts of the world? Uh, we certainly do. We, we've we've uh, provided outreach and assistance uh, to even countries. I've been to Cuba three or four times. Uh, South American countries, been to Brazil. Um, one of my colleagues has done a lot of work in, in China and, and uh, Czech Republic. So we, we do a lot of international work. Uh, usually we try to liaison with either a government agency or another university there where we um, 
you, you know, you don't want to be that instant expert that shows up with a briefcase and more than 50 miles from home <laughs> exactly. makes you an expert. Uh, so we, we try to tie into the, the systems. Uh, uh, in Dominican Republic, uh, we work some with the universities, but we, we work with EDIOF, which is their uh, government research agency, to try to, to work with them through, through that channels uh, that way. Um, and we try to provide information through those work with them on specific questions, but we also see that as an opportunity to recruit and bring students back into our program. So it, it's a two-way street, not a one-way flow in, in those. So we, we do a lot of international work, um, but as a small program, that's, it's, it's difficult to, to be helping there and doing all the things we have to do here. So it, it's a big mm -hmm. load. And, and to you've, as you have spent a few weeks at a time uh, traveling internationally it's 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 tough on family and friends and the whole thing too so. it, it certainly can uh, present some challenges yes sir <laughs> to put it mildly no doubt it's very rewarding mm. it's great mm. and fun and that type of thing but it it has its challenges well jim as you look at your program at kentucky state university and also look at programs overseas what do you see as some of the major challenges confronting you today um, funding i guess is always a problem anytime but uh, what do you see as some of the technical issues or some of the perhaps cultural issues yeah. that you confront? Well, um, as, as you said, funding is um, always an issue. As, as university budgets uh, contract, which they have definitely done, uh, this type of research is, is, is not cheap. The facilities are significant. The upkeep is significant. Um, training graduate students is, is an expensive proposition. Uh, but whenever anybody does a study, the return on that investment's about three to one or four to one. So uh, it, it's not a cost, it's an investment, but as all investments are, you've got to be able to convey that information and make people realize that there's a return on that investment. There's even things like what, what we see as one of our assets, which is online education, many programs see as a threat. Uh, uh, why would a student come and do his master's here if he can get all the coursework without ever leaving home? Mm -hmm. So we we ourselves struggle with how do we have the the classic graduate student that comes and does a thesis research project and still teach these online courses that are available anywhere. So what education and higher education, even graduate education will look like in 10, 20 years is, is also a challenge uh, to be defined. And, and then even the internationalization, uh, how do we, we, we work with those? How do we bring those students here? Because a post 9-11 world, uh, getting student visas and, and getting those students here is, is much more difficult than it used to be. So mm -hmm. uh, the world is changing, it has changed, it continues to change and, and keeping up with that change is, is, is a constant challenge. Exactly. Well, Jim, the last minute or so we have, let's look at aquaculture. Aquaculture is an important industry. It's an exciting, a dynamic industry. Are there certain best practices that have come out of this that can be shared with our viewers today and that aquaculturists can share with one another in the United States and around the world? Well, that, that is a role that FAO has tried to play as, as far as not so much policing as, as it is recognizing what issues are, how to address those issues and, and make uh, standard practices or best practices to be adopted in feed manufacture or processing or, or, or the, the use of chemicals or how to not use chemicals in production mm -hmm. and, and those kind of things. So FAO plays a big role. We actually have some private agencies that, that do best practices and organic recommendations on, on mm -hmm. how to be certified according to those practices. Well, Dr. Jim Tidwell, aquaculture is a very important area. We're going to be reading a lot more about it in the future, but I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative Always program. Glad, Bill. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thanks for joining us on today's Global Connections program.